for most of us, who was your lead teacher teaching you about love? If you think about it, for most of us, it was our mother. Now, she may not have done it perfectly. In fact, some things that you may have learned from mom may have been from some of her mistakes, some of her shortcomings as well. But the lead teacher in every home is oftentimes mom teaching about love. It could be that the nine-month connection in the womb gives us a connection that just lasts forever. It also stands, in fact, this morning we're going to take a look at Romans 12, and as we read through Romans 12, verses 9 through 21, through, uh, we're going to look at it through kind of like three different eyes. The, the first time, I just want you to think in terms of how did this exemplify your mother, what she was like for you? And you're going to see that there's going to be several things that are going to come out of the verses that are going to relate to your mom. It also stands as a guide for how we should love others. And so second, I want you to think about just how do you love people in your family? Do you love like Romans 12 says? By the way, pause for a minute. And I want you to think about how old was your mom when you were born? How old was your mom when you were born? My mom was uh, 21. I was the second of three children born 14 months apart, each one. That literally meant that mom had three kids two years and younger, that she was trying to take care of all at the same time. Starts to explain to me why uh, we had some of the dynamics we had in our home. Most moms learn about love and parenting while they're doing it. <laughs> and yes, they will make some mistakes. Most feel inadequate, though they long for the opportunity for motherhood. Romans 12 is a manual on how to love others. God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were opposed to him, when we were major imperfect, when we were messed up, he died to show his love to us. God has, by the way, uniquely placed all of us in some key relationships. We're, we call that our 8 to 15, our oikos. Every single one of us has 8 to 15 people that, that, that we're in relationship with. Some of that will be a mother, a father, brother, sister, sons, daughters, grandchildren, people that we spend regular time with. Then we have our coworkers. We have our neighbors. We have people that we just regularly see. Those are all part of our oikos, our 8 to 15 people. When we're young, our parents and our family make up most of our oikos, don't they? Or maybe cousins, right? <laughs> make, up, make up our oikos, the people that we get to spend time with. As we a get older, what happens? Our 8 to 15 starts to change. They become, the, like I said, the co-laborers. And, and the fact is, is that sometimes we may find out that we have someone in our 8 to 15 that is a little bit challenging to love, maybe even difficult. We might call them not just only a difficult person, but someone that's tough people to love. Did you ever make it hard for your mother to love you? <laughs> Becky's saying yes because mom's sitting there and saying, hey, you better admit it. <laughs> if you think about it, even the best of you have at some points in time made it hard <laughs> for your mom. In fact, every single one of us is probably a difficult, tough person for somebody else personalities are all different and for somebody there's somebody who's like I don't like them and yet I'm stuck with them sometimes happens with in-laws <laughs> sometimes happens with your own brother and sister <laughs> sometimes happens with the person that is seated next to you today in church <laughs> but aren't we all <laughs> careful careful no 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 none of this okay <laughs> But aren't we all tough to love at some time? 
every single one of us sometimes gets a little bit impatient, maybe a little bit irritable, a little bit unkind, a little bit rude. And we all have the streak that becomes tough to love. Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Let's again, as we go through this the first time, think about your mom. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Moms know we are tough people. Now think about it. We're, we're, they start right from the beginning. They go through labor to give us birth. And then they clean up messy diapers. They get barfed on. They get, they, they get to all, all the kinds of fun things. And that's just in the first few months. Well, it may continue. Children grow up, and as they grow up, they continue to do what? Messy diapers, well, other messes. They continue to barf on you. They continue to get sick, and you still have to take care of them. And moms get that privilege. Passage describes love like a mom would normally do. Yet it's not the love that we always give, is it? We were reading through that passage. I'm sure there's some times where you're thinking, yeah, well, mom didn't do that. Or thank God mom didn't do that. Or, oh, I didn't do that either, did I? In Romans 12, God shows us how to relate also to the people in the family of God. How we should be relating here with one another in this place. And <laughs> how to love difficult people. By the way, last week we had a, an important point. And that message was this. God's will is always others-centered. We are here to benefit others, not ourselves. Is your love sincere? The other word you might want to use for that is not hypocritical. In the Living Translation of Romans 12, 9, it says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Tom Mercer said Jesus hated insincerity. In fact, the only people he never got along with were the Pharisees. Why? Because they weren't sincere in caring about other people. They expected a lot from the people, but they didn't really care for the people. Mercer goes on. Maybe that's our problem as well. We expect a lot from others, but don't really care for them. We have a responsibility right here. Not just to sit here and pretend. <laughs> we greet people on a Sunday morning, right? And smile at them. You're like, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Are you really? <laughs> do, you, do you really mean it? How many times do we maybe sit here kind of wanting to avoid? So, oh, great. They're here today. <laughs> Never, no one ever's done that in church, though, right? Hmm. What is the definition of a tough person? A tough person is someone you wish God had put in someone else's oikos. <laughs> we all have 8 to 15. Would you like to take one of mine? <laughs> uh, that, that's a tough person. Paul said we're supposed to honor people 
above ourselves. When you honor someone above yourself, you think more about their interests than you do of your own. Isn't this a clue to loving anyone? I, if we're going to really love other people, don't we need to go get to know what their interests are? And maybe actually join them in their interests? I wonder if that's where the phrase soccer mom came from. I don't know how many ladies, especially, uh, I can remember when, when Tim was growing up, who's over here, by the way, today. Uh, I can remember that when, when Tim was growing up, soccer was still pretty new as a competitive sport for children and young people. In fact, he, he was just getting into it and all. And Debbie knew nothing about soccer. Zero. But, but she became a soccer mom. Why? Because Tim was interested in it. Because Tim was participating. And so, in fact, she actually started leaving sometimes on Sunday mornings and not attending worship so she could take Tim to soccer tournaments in order to show Tim her love, her respect for him. Soccer mom. Don't we have to learn to become involved in the interests to really of others to if we're going to really love them? <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie The Game Plan? Yeah? Okay, you, you might remember it this way. It's the story of a rugged superstar quarterback named Jack, Joe, excuse me, Joe Kingman. Uh, he's, a, he's on a Boston-based team that is chasing a championship. He's a serial bachelor. And he has a little girl that shows up at his door as he's getting ready for the playoffs. And it turns out that this little girl is his seven-year-old daughter that was born to his wife just, uh, actually, they became pregnant just before they split up. And they're now divorced. And in fact, the sad thing is, is that mom has died, and the little girl is trying to find dad. <laughs> His dream of the championship is sacked when he discovers this seven-year-old daughter that he never knew. Now, during the most important time in his career, he must figure out how to juggle his parties, practices, and dates with the newfound ballet classes, bedtime stories, and dolls that come with his daughter. <laughs> I can't help but thinking that some dads have children and they were expecting to have boys who played football or baseball and they were going to coach them or soccer, or whatever it might be. And it turns out that they have girls instead. And if they have more than one, they're now a dodo, dads of daughters only. And they have to learn, they have to learn how to become a cheerleader, a dance instructor, a ballet or a ballerina. And that's what, that's what Joe had to do as he takes his team and goes out and performs on the, on the ba in the ballet for his little girl and learns that he can do that in pride for her because he loves her. Don't we have to learn to get involved in the lives of the people that we love? And if we're supposed to love the people next to us, even our tough people, even people we don't know, don't we need to build relationship with them and start to get involved in what matters to them, what's important to them? Romans 12 goes on, verse 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in afflictions, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Do you ever feel just like spiritually drained? You feel like your spiritual energy is just gone. You're just sapped. Maybe you've been doing too much. The interesting thing is what the text tells us is that if you really are spiritually drained and you want to be spiritually energized, go serve. Now, careful. It doesn't say go work. Because sometimes we can do too much, and that's wrong too. But he says, go serve someone else. In fact, the, the text here where it has actually two different translations. It says that we are to share with the Lord's people, excuse me, never be lacking zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. The word for Lord there is kurios. But there's another word that sometimes also get, goes in there. And, the, and that word is kairos. Both of them have a K-R-S. And oftentimes, scribes would abbreviate a word. And so instead of it being curios, K-U-R-I-O-S, 
or Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, it would just be K-R-S. Now think about that. What is Kyrios means Lord. Maintain your spiritual fervor by serving the Lord. Kairos means time, opportunity. Maintain your spiritual fervor by seizing the opportunities to serve. Carpe diem, you heard it from the movie and from other phrases. Seize the day. Take the opportunity that's available to you. When an opportunity comes to serve, serve. And you will maintain your spiritual fervor if you're serving the Lord. How do you personally treat people? Paul says to do it with hope. And that will give you joy. He also goes on, he says, and be patient with people. Let God control your responses to hard times and mean people. But be sure that you're faithful in doing what? In praying for them. We all have this 8 to 15 people. They're a part of our world that we have responsibility for. How much time do you spend praying for your 8 to 15? Incidentally, in your bulletin again is a, is a card. Uh, by the way, Virgil, is this your card? It looks like your handwriting. No? no? Shucks. Does anybody know Don Knight? K-N-I-G-H-T? Denny, this is your card? <laughs> Keep your card. <laughs> Please take those cards that are in your worship bulletin right now. And even while I'm talking this morning, would you give some thought as to who are the 8 to 15 people that are part of your life? that you spend significant time with. We'll talk about that again in a few moments. We need to be different. God has called us to be world changers. Now, what's a world changer? A world changer is someone who actively encourages people in their relational world to become Christ followers. What's your relational world? That's what we're referring to as your, our oikos, those 8 to 15 people that we have a relationship with, that we spend time with. And it's all different kinds of people, but there's, each of us has 8 to 15. God's called us to change our world, but we do that not by changing everybody out there, by a, but by what we do with the 8 to 15 that we do know, that we're responsible for, that God's put there. And unfortunately, some of them are tough people. Now, there may be three different probably groups of people in your 8 to 15. The first, and these I think are really critical people, God has put you in relationship with non-believers, people that don't know Jesus at all, completely unchurched people. Oh, they may have been going sometime, they may have even gone as a kid, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What's your role for them? Your role for them is to show them Jesus. Is that through your relationship to uh, use that word that some of us get really nervous about, evangelize. All that means is to good news them. Tell them good things. And part of that good, those good things that you're going to share with them is not just your life, your house, yourself, but also your Lord, Jesus Christ. The second group of people are believers who are not walking with the Lord. Who knows? They could have been broken by something. Maybe they, every church has them. They went through some kind of a church split some kind of a fight that got them negative about God, and they just stopped going. Maybe they were involved as a youth and made a commitment to Jesus Christ, but they got to college, and they've kind of lost it ever since then. But there are people who are no longer walking with the Lord. Some, some were Christians that, for some reason, have just gotten distracted, and they're simply not participating with the rest of the body of Christ. What's your role for them? To help them get back on track to pick up where they left off and you become their biggest cheerleader. You invite them to connect and reconnect to Jesus and his people. Oh, and by the way, what did he say? Pray for them. Third group, believers who are presently walking with Christ. You have somebody in your family, in your 8 to 15, and they're, they're walking with Jesus already. Now what's your job for them? Well, your responsibility for them is to continue to walk beside them, to continue to encourage them in their relationship with Jesus and encourage them to keep moving forward and allow them to encourage you. And oh, by the way, pray for them. And if I didn't say it for the first one, pray for them. With all, one of, the, all of these three groups in our oikos, we should be praying for them daily. 
Paul goes on and he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless. The word for blessing means to be happy. We should be trying to help people who are even cursing us be happy. Robert E. Lee was asked his opinion of an opposing general who was his sworn enemy. He gave a glowing representation of the man, pointing out many truly great qualities he possessed. An aide took him aside and said, don't you remember what that general said about you? Lee replied, but they didn't ask his opinion of me, but my opinion of him. God has called us to bless people, even the people who are doing wrong to us, even the people who might actually be hurting us. We are supposed to bless them rather than curse them. In fact, verse 15, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. What Question, do you find it easier to mourn with somebody who's hurting or to rejoice with somebody who just got a raise that you wanted? Oh, I mean, excuse me, to rejoice with somebody. Is it, is it easier to rejoice or to mourn? Sadly, sometimes when somebody else is hurt and we're kind of like, <laughs> we're rejoicing that they're mourning? No, that shouldn't be the case, right? Are you mourning with the people who are hurting and are you rejoicing with somebody who's rejoicing? Do you celebrate when somebody else has good fortune? When they got a promotion, even though you didn't? When something great happened to them, and you think, why didn't that happen to me? You see, well, as soon as we've moved to us, we've stopped celebrating them, haven't we? Live in harmony, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. <laughs> Here's the challenge. Paul knows that some of us think we're more important than somebody else. And the fact is, you're not more important than anyone else. Have you noticed how babies don't understand this? They think they're very important, don't they? <laughs> I apologize if I'm saying too much about grandchildren, but, but when, we, when we watch Theo, all of a sudden, if he sees his bottle and he's hungry, he is the most important person in that room. And he knows how to communicate that he wants that bottle, and he will not stop that communication until he gets that bottle. Even if the bottle's not warm yet, and it's not ready yet, and you can't give it, or it's too hot. No, no, he, he wants that bottle, and you better give it to him because he's the most important person in the room. See, babies don't understand that. Uh, I'm afraid, though, that sometimes us old people don't understand it either, that we are not the most important person in the room. And I guess I would simply say, don't be a baby. Some of us are conceited and thinking too much of ourselves instead of caring about other people. And we need to, need to learn not to be babies. Paul goes on, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Folks, this is tough now. Now we're really talking about how do we love tough people. And he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is when sacrificial love kicks in. This is agape love. This is the kind of love that Jesus loved. When even being attacked and killed, he still gave out love. When someone does evil to you, what do you do? Someone gets angry about the way you're driving. You're driving too slow. You're driving too fast. You're driving in the wrong lane. You're in the inside when you should be on the outside. You cut them off accidentally, but they don't believe that. You did it intentionally. Somebody sees you doing something that they didn't like, and they give you the one-finger wave. And what do you do in response? Most of you are good Christians, and so you don't give them a wave back. You may even smile. But the question is, not what do you do outwardly, but what is it that you do inwardly? 
they give you that, uh, that one-fingered wave, and you go what? Blank you, but you don't say it. Maybe somebody's sitting next to you and you don't want them to hear it. Maybe they're not, but you don't want to look bad, so you don't say it, but in your own thoughts, you do what? That's what you do to them, Denny? Mm -hmm. You just took both hands off the wheel, Denny. <laughs> See, it's not just what you do visibly. It's not just what you do verbally. It's what you do in your heart. And by the way, may I remind you, everyone's watching you. Especially if you are a Jesus Christ follower. People are watching you. Have you ever wondered why your kids are repeating things that you, that you say, I can't, I, where'd they get that from? I can't believe they're making that kind of a statement. They've been, they've been at the wrong house. Somebody's been speaking bad words and they've picked them up. Of course, it wouldn't have been mom or dad. Kids are watching you. Grandparents, your grandkids are watching you. Your neighbor's watching you. That person that you told about your church is watching you. That person you that saw you with the Jesus sticker is watching you. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It's interesting, Paul says, if it's possible. The fact is, it may not be totally possible, right? He even goes on and qualifies that further, as long as it depends on you. The fact is, is that some relationships, people get ticked off at you when you didn't really do anything. When you're really trying to do something good. When, when you've even tried to be a peacemaker and it still comes off in a negative way to them. And, they, and you might not be able to make peace. And yet, Paul says, live at peace with everyone. It's simply not possible to live at peace with everyone, though, is it? So he says, as, long, as much as it's possible, as it depends upon you, live at peace. Barclay says, we would do well to remember that goodness is a great deal easier for some than for others. That will keep us alike from criticism and from discouragement. Some people, it's easy for them to be nice. Some people, they really have to work at it. It's easier for some than it is for others. Live at peace with everyone as much as it is your responsibility, as much as you can make that possible, as far as it depends upon you. And here's where it does depend upon you. He says, do not take revenge. My dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Whose job is it to make people feel bad about what they've done? The preacher thinks. <laughs> it's God's responsibility. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts people. It's not our job to take revenge and to make them feel bad. Let God do the work of convicting people. Let him do the work of judging them for their wrongs. And the fact is, he will judge. Our job is to look past their actions and instead to love them. To love them. We have a responsibility to fervently serve tough people and the Lord. Verse 20 says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. In ancient days, people used to actually take a, a dish, if you will, or a pot with burning coals in it, and they put them on their head and carry them around the village or the town and everyone knew, oh, there's somebody who's feeling guilty about something they did. They're feeling bad. And so this was a symbol of that, these burning coals sitting there on top of their head, feeling bad. And he says, look, by the way, folks, we need to go ahead and be contrary. Wait a second, that goes totally against what you've been saying all the, this whole message, Bill. Oh, no, it doesn't. We need to be contrary to what the world does and love like Jesus loved. So he says, 
Pastor Beck, how can we do something outrageous? Love somebody who has just been mean to you. Show goodness, kindness, mercy to them. And, and Paul says, in so doing, you will heap burning coals on their head. You will touch their heart, what he's really saying, by your goodness rather than by your meanness. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I appreciate what Barclay said on that one. He said, the only real way to destroy an enemy is to make him a friend. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. 1 Peter 4.8, Peter said, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. In his book, Making Things Right When Things Go Wrong, Paul Faulkner writes this account. When the Romans conquered a nation, it was their custom to place a yoke in the center of each city, symbolizing submission to Roman rule. They'd take a, bit, a large yoke, like it was put on oxen, put it in the center of the city, and this would be a symbol that they are now submitting to the Roman rule. They would then install mire markers radiating out from the yoke along the nation's roads. These mile markers indicated the distance a Roman soldier could require a conquered citizen to carry his pack. Picture a Jew chopping weeds in his field. He calls himself a Christian, but his negative attitude denies it. He's complaining to God because it hasn't rained, and he's cursing the weeds that have taken over his crop when a Roman soldier spies him and shouts, You! Come over here and carry my load. This forced intrusion really sets him off. He throws down his hoe, trudges to the road, and snatches up the load, breaking the strap. <laughs> he blames the broken strap, claiming it was weak. The Roman soldier cuffs him and forces him to carry the bag without a strap, which is most difficult. After hearing him fret, fume, and denounce the Roman government for the entire mile, the Roman soldier is glad to send him back home. Our Christian man is in depression now and even further behind in his work. He returns to the field to find his hoe is broken from his having thrown it down in disgust. He stomps home. His wife meets him. Hi, honey, home early? Don't honey me. The children come around the house. Daddy's home! Daddy's home! I thought I told you to feed the chickens, he shouts. The family is headed for a wonderful evening, aren't they? Not far down the road, the Romans spot another Jew. Not wishing to encounter another belligerent Jew, but, but reluctant to tote his bag with a broken strap, he shouts to the man in the field, Come carry this bag! To his surprise, the Jew quickly puts down his hoe and almost runs to the road to help the soldier. The first thing the Jew notices is the broken strap. He volunteers that he has an awl and leather and can fix it promptly if the soldier will just wait in the shade of the tree. They haven't walked a hundred yards before the soldier knows this Jew is like none he has ever met. He is animated and engaging. Before he knows it, the soldier is talking about his family as if he were an old friend. It seems only a few minutes when the soldier says, Oh, I'm sorry. You've carried my pack a mile and a half. I know, said the Jew, but it seemed only half a mile. Ever since I met the carpenter, my whole lot outlook on life has changed. Everything and everybody seemed different for some reason. The soldier had already noticed. This carpenter, the soldier said, who is he? Where is he from? They had already gone two miles by now, and the Jew explained that he really must go bit, get back. But he noted, you are headed straight into Capernaum where the carpenter is teaching. Please join the crowd. I'll bet he will make a difference in your life too. He returned home, almost skipping as he went. He picked up his hoe, 
and it seemed to him so light he just th flew through the rest of his weeds. Hi, honey. You're home early. Yes, he replied. And where are my precious children? She said, ah, I know what's up. You come in smiling with that gleam in your eye. You've been another second mile, haven't you? Hmm. What happens when we intentionally choose to go the second mile with the tough people in our lives? When we decide to bless and not curse, when we decide to show love and kindness, the opposite of what that person may actually be showing to us. A young couple got married and they were so happy, but he quickly changed and became verbally abusive and emotionally shared no love with her. He became an alcoholic and it worsened still. This went on for 25 years. One day, when he happened to be sober, he looked at their wedding photos on the wall. It seemed like the first time he'd ever looked at them. As he gazed upon his bride's young face, he couldn't help but notice how happy she looked with that sparkle in her eye. He turned and looked at her on that day, though only in her 40s. The face was much different now, tired and wrinkled, aged far beyond her years. It smote his heart as he realized, I've done that to her. I turned her from this to this. He confessed this to her and asked for her forgiveness and turned his life around. Later on, he would ask her, how in the world could you put up with me for all those years and keep loving me said, the only way I could was by constantly reminding myself that's exactly the way God loved me while I was yet a sinner. And I share that illustration then, and then share it in some care as well, because the fact is, is that not every man will come to that place, really, of recognition of his wrong or woman. Jerry Shirley talking about this passage said, you'll never do anything more Christ-like than loving your enemy. And you'll never find anything more contrary to your human nature than blessing your enemies when they are mad, rejoicing with them when they are glad, and comforting them when they are sick. Some questions for you to ponder. Are you loving other Christians as if you were intimately associated with them as your kin? Right here. You may be attending church, but are you actually interacting with other believers? And what are some practical ways that you could show love towards brothers and sisters in Christ who are within your sphere of influence? Could you assist in meeting their needs? Are you even aware of what your brothers and sisters need? Jesus said we're supposed to what? Love one another. The real test of our Christianity is not loving those who love us. The real test is loving those who hate us. Are you aware of the enemies that you have? Do you have any? If you are aware of who they are, is there something that you could do, some expression that you could make of your love for them? Romans 12 has given us a, a number of instructions practical things for us to do to show love to one another, to the people in our oikos, and that includes the people who are our tough people. 
does God say that if you love your tough people, that they will automatically change and become wonderful? No. In fact, they may not change at all. But notice that's not our responsibility, is it? Our responsibility is to love and allow God to work in them. Let's pray. God, we're broken people. We're imperfect. Frankly, Lord, if we're going to be really honest today, it's hard for us to love. It's hard for us to love even sometimes the good people around us, let alone the tough people, God. It's hard to really care about them and express love in the ways that you've described. Wow. Blessing them and when they are cursing us. Showing them kindness when they're being mean. Lord, help us. Help us to recognize that even though we may be a lot nicer, kinder, well-behaved and all that, the fact is that compared to you, we're just as messed up as the tough people in our lives. It's hard for us, Lord. It had to be hard for you to love us because it meant dying on a cross even when we were opposed to you. And we have people like that in our oikos, God. People who are in opposition to you. People who don't care about you at all. Help us, Lord, to know how to love them like you've loved us. I pray for the moms here today. Sometimes the tough people are the very children that they've given life to. Sometimes the tough person is the person they see in the mirror. And it's hard for them to love themselves. Lord, oh, I pray for the movement of our we would know and believe how much you love us and that that would help us to love the people around us like you've loved us. And I thank you, God, that you won't condemn us and you understand that there will be some times that we'll just say, I can't do it. But you still care. God, draw us even closer to you. In Jesus' name. Worship team, please come. That's right. Rooftop is your house. <laughs> and that means you should let the people closest to you know about Jesus and his love. <laughs> right? Good. So would you stand, and, and today, um, if you have a, a, a prayer request, please put that in the offering plate. Moms, especially, if there's some way that we can bless you more personally, please note that. And um, we also have some goodies over there for you. Uh, you're welcome to take uh, some of those flowers off the table or cut some off the rose bushes out front as well. Uh, God bless you. Please stand. <laughs>